Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Marlene Targ Brill, who is an author, educator, presenter, and not a drummer. Marlene, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Bart. This is really exciting. Sure. Um, and let me explain the not a drummer thing. So you're obviously an author, but you are a bit of an expert on our topic today, which is, uh, I think we're pronouncing his name right. We both kind of said that. Orion P. Howe, who is um, bo- standalone. He's one of the youngest people to receive uh, the Medal of Honor, which we'll kind of talk about what that is for people who may not know. But um, but he's also a drummer boy in the Civil War. Um, and before we get in, this is really cool because I had someone uh, comment, um, Eric McKnight commented just on a post I put on Instagram and said, Hey, Bart, check out this topic. And that was like a week ago. And here we are recording this. So it's, this happened really fast. Cause I, it was, it was quick for me to find you. So, um, all that being said, Marlene, why don't we, uh, why don't you tell us about Orion and, uh, you know, who is he? What's his, I know his family is drummers. So take it away. Tell us all about him. Well, Orion Howe um, uh, entered the military. Uh, well, actually, he wasn't the first one. His father was a veteran of the Mexican-American War, and he played the fife. And when the Civil War was getting getting revved up, he um, had given his, his two sons, Orion, uh, who was 12 at the time, and Liston, who was 10. He gave them some uh, drums, and they were practicing, and he would take them out to different rallies to kind of drum up some business for uh, recruiting different soldiers. And, and it was a motivational kind of thing, and it was also a rallying cry. And that's one of the main uh, jobs of drummers. And eventually, um, his father and uh, and uh, Liston went off to war. And the the thinking was that Orion, as the elder son, should go to school so he can eventually take over whatever was going on with the family and his father's uh, uh, cabinet making business. And that that didn't turn out so well. Orion was having a really hard time being in school. The boys were dropping out one after another, and he felt like he was he was kind of a sissy. And eventually, ran away. And he he coaxed his stepmother into letting him uh, join the military. And that's when he went and joined his brother, and they became drummers in the civil in the different battles in the Civil War. And eventually, the father, who had been in a different uh, regimen transferred so he could be with his sons. He became the principal musician, and he was in charge of the bands um, in the the fifty fifth regiment. Wow. Now, okay, so let's just clarify too, so people know, like when he's at school and not going to the you know into battle and feeling like a sissy. How old was he? Let's, because I mean, it's pretty wild. He was about twelve years old, <laughs> and so he would he would keep practicing because he, he was ready to go. You know, but it, yeah. it 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 wasn't happening, and then finally he couldn't take it anymore. All right, now before we move on, first off, when I was twelve, I was like, I mean, I couldn't fathom going to. to it was a, it's a different time, obviously, but like, you know, I was playing video games in my parents' basement. I mean, it's just it's a different world, obviously. But um, what? Le- obviously, he legally couldn't go into you know, the army, the military, right? I mean, they, you, you can't be a 12 year old. I know it's 1860 and the, you know, civil war was on, but that's so young. How did he really get in? His brother was 10. So that's, you know, that's, you know, even younger. And, um, I guess he could go with parents permission. I believe the youngest drummer boy was Johnny Clem, who um, I forgot what his nickname was, but he entered when he was nine years old. And I think he got a parent to sign for him or he ran away and got some other adults to sign for him. And so I believe he was the absolute youngest. And I know one of your previous uh, speakers talked about how most of the drummer boys really weren't boys in essence. They were older teens early 20s. But, uh, you know, doing this research, I found a whole host of young people who had had joined, you know, 10, 12, 14, you know, which is still pretty young. Yeah. You know, and um, it's kind of cool, too, because I'm from Ohio, but like I've I've 
looked up um, Johnny Clem before as well, because because wasn't he one of the oldest surviving Civil War drummers? Um, I know he's he's up there because he's 1851 to 1937. But him and Orion are both from Ohio, which is kind of cool. I'm from Ohio. I think they're more um, north uh, towards like the Toledo area. But um, God, 10 years old. I mean, some of these guys, I can't imagine being so young. You're you're a little boy. You're a kid. It's just wild. Now, okay, carry carry on with the story. So the 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 Howe family is now together, right? Serving right. together, um, playing music. The dad was playing the fife, right, and leading the. Uh, you know, he was the the head of the. What was what was his role? That William Howe was principal conductor, and I guess for some reason they had qualified older people who were part of the. The, the band at the time and those people left and more and more young people were coming like like Orion and his brother Liston and um, I guess the soldiers were getting grumpier about you know and had all kinds of nicknames for these for these youngsters and actually the family was from Ohio but when Orion's mother died when he was know, a toddler mm-hmm. a little older and the family moved to Waukegan to be closer to William's sister so she could help take care of the two young boys. And so that's where they were. And that's when I talk about the 55th Regiment. It was the 55th Illinois. Okay. Let's keep going forward here. Obviously, we're leading up to the point where there was obviously a battle and there was, you know, the Medal of Honor and all that stuff. But, um, yeah, what else happened as the the family's now together? And, uh, yeah, keep it going from there. Um, well, eventually, well, the boys, um, they, mind you, they were about four feet, six inches. Yeah. So when they finally got uniforms, they dragged and the drum also dragged on the ground and they had to make adjustments for boys as young as Orion and Liston. And the family was together and the father kind of protected the boys a little bit in that they didn't have to do too many awful things, but they still did the breadth of activities besides drumming that most drummer boys experienced. And um, they stayed together and then the father got sick and he left. Hmm and went home and that meant that the boys were pretty much on their own and so it was getting more lonesome and they were finally getting into more battles and it was a little bit scarier jeez well back up so back up for a sec what were some of the duties that drummers would perform that were not just playing the drums i imagine they weren't too nice to these young boys and made them do stuff like you know cleaning things and but yeah what what would they do they were the ones who actually um, handled all the communications up and down the line, meaning the soldiers. And they had to sleep near the officers so that whenever an officer wanted to send a message, they would be available. Hmm. So they would drill um, for a wake up, which meant that, you know, maybe four or five in the morning, they would wake everybody up and they weren't too happy with the boys. Um, they would, you know, also sound uh, for lineup and meal calls and lights out. And then they would have to learn other beats to tell foot soldiers to run or stay put. Um, and and then they would drum along with, with, you know, whatever else was going on. Now, the boys also had other duties. They would help with um, carrying things. They would help with uh, the medical corps and, um, and they would help the surgeons. They would be the ones to carry the bodies. Man, picking up bodies and stuff. Again, you just, I guess it's just people were tougher then, but I just think of these poor little kids. Y- you see, if you look on Wikipedia, and I'll post one on, um, on social media for people to see, but you see these pictures of these little boys, and they have these looks on their face of like, I don't know, just like, like they've seen some stuff. Like they've seen more horrible things in their 14 years of life than I have and probably ever will in my 30 years of life. It's like, you got to be tough. It's just so You do, different. but in essence, they were still boys underneath. And I found some information um, in, in the olden days. I don't know. I'm sure they keep records now of every, every, everything that's going on. But um, there's a book called The 55th Illinois from 1861 to 1865. And that was um, 
written by the officers and put together as a record of what was happening with this particular regiment. And that's where I got most of my information. And there's okay. one part I'd like to read to you from the book to show that these were really boys underneath. Yeah. That um, outsider sleeping quarters, that was in when they were in transit, so I believe they were in St. Louis at the time, uh, faced a huge open square. Here we march and parade sun up to sundown. Often the weather quickly shifts from clear to cold to rain. The parade ground turns to a sea of gray moss. On a gloomy rainy day, us boys try to make our own sunshine. We shed our shoes and socks, roll up our britches, and hop lively through the puddles. Liston, Joe, um, these are the other people who they hung out with, uh, somebody they called Betsy because he was probably whiny. Uh, mm -hmm. Philip and I slop along uh, singing John Brown's body. So they were still they were still into doing boy things. Yeah. Wow. On a battlefield. I mean, <laughs> so there's a lot of people, which is awesome, who listen to this show who um, are outside of America. Um, where maybe you take for granted that people know about the Civil War. We probably should have done this earlier on, but so obviously it's um, the North versus the South. Um, Orion would have been a Union soldier, which is the North. Um, and it's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's known kind of as one of the bloodiest wars in history, right? I mean, it was just so brutal and there was no, like, it's just such a, there's there, like the the technology of like, you know, helping wounded soldiers. I mean, it was just horrible. And to think of these little boys <laughs> jumping around is just nuts. Now, uh, do you know, it's kind of a weird question, I guess, but I guess it wouldn't be documented really, but like, would he be considered, would these boys be considered like really good drummers or was it just like, like, here's a drum, here's some sticks, play the, you know, play along and don't get out of, uh, out of, you know, time. Like, were they trained at all or was it just sort of like figure it out as you go? Um, no, they were trained. And by the Civil War, there were very specific trainings. Um, and I found where um, for drummers um, uh, during the American Civil War, they were younger than the previous ones, the Revolutionary Wars. So they had to shorten the drums a little bit, shorten all different kinds of things to make them fit the, the drummers who were playing them. And each drummer was required to play variations of 26 rudiments. Does that mm -hmm. make sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. The rudiment that meant attack was a long roll. The rudiment for assembly was a series of flams, while the rudiments for drummers call were a mixture of flams and rolls. The rudiment for simple cadence was open beating with a flam repeat. Additional requirements included the double stroke roll, Paradiddles, flamadiddles, flam accents, flam accues, rough, roughs, roughs, yep, yep, uh, yep. single and double drags, random accues, and sex tuplets. And a lot of this was put down in a book by Bruce and Emmett, Bruce yeah, and yeah. Emmett's 1862, The Drummers and Pfeiffer's Guide. So early on, even though drumming went back to ancient Babylon, early on during the wars, there was a recognition that you absolutely needed to, to standardize these on both sides for Union and um, Confederate. And that, um, and, and that was how they, they came to, to do the same things. And in terms of, you know, they weren't rock stars back then, but they were stars in what they did. So they did have training and yeah. they did have some standards. No, that's great. And and sometimes it I have to ask a question to then remember sort of more information about it. And and um I recommend people if they want to hear more about kind of the notation, they can go back to the episode with Mark Beecher, um, who's the president of the National Association of Rudimental Drumming or Drummers. And um he actually talked about, I think he talked about, I believe it was George Washington who was all like embarrassed about how the drum core sounded. And it was like so terrible that he then actually kind of made it like a, a thing where it's like, no, 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 we're going to get these guys and kids sounding better, which then led to obviously um, uh, more of the the formation of like, you know, notation and all that stuff. So I think it, 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 it sort of was a, over time they realized, uh, okay, we need to, it makes the whole army look bad if these, <laughs> if people can't play their instrument correctly. So, um, but that was a great, 
great bit of information. It's fun to hear you say uh, flammadiddles and paradiddles and all that. As a <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, cool. Now that answers that. All right. So correct. Stop me if I'm going too fast here, but um, he obviously got the Medal of Honor. They don't just hand that out. So um, what happened? And, and again, pause if there's other things that happened before that are interesting with his family and his and his um, you know career as a drummer. But how did he end up getting the uh, Medal of Honor? Well, if if I may, could I yeah. read the section that talks about what happened? Please, and and let's and you probably have a better ex- explanation of it. But um, just so again, people um, around the world know. Um, not if if my uh, pretty bad explanation of what the Civil War was wasn't enough. I'm now going to read a Google explanation of of what a Medal of Honor is. So it says the requirements for the Medal of Honor were standardized among all the services, requiring that all recipient had distinguished himself conspicuously by gallantry and in- intrepidity. <laughs> at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty. So that's kind of a confusing way of, of saying that you really have to do something extremely brave and put yourself in danger, right? Just to explain what it is. Yes, that's accurate. Okay, great. That being said, now, yeah, please read this uh, segment. Okay. And this was May 27th, 1863, and this was near Vicksburg. And I write, this is a first person from a count from Diary of a Drummer Boy, which is fictionalized, it, but it's it's got all the rudiments that were from the 55th Illinois Regiment book. Right. This is the first day my head is clear. I have been mending in a field hospital near Vicksburg since May 19th. On the fearful day, I was wounded in our attack on the last rebel stronghold before Vicksburg Bluffs. What happened was we drummed the order down the line to strike at about two o'clock. Three cannonball blasts followed, signaling a mad charge of howling men toward the rebels. I was supposed to run to the rear supply wagons with the other musicians, but I followed our colors to Fort Hill Ditch instead. I joined this war to help, not sit back and watch. Our main line stopped suddenly where the ditch proved too deep to cross. Heavy fire reached within 50 paces of us, coming from rebels guarding Graveyard Road, which leads to Vicksburg. Our only cover was to lie flat behind the ditch. The zip-zip from pistols made my skin creep. Um, And then he talks about different comrades falling dead. Hmm. Union soldiers loaded and fired one round after another. Then the men started running out of cartridges. Yet rebel fire grew hotter, killing and wounding more men around me. It took it, I took it upon myself to collect cartridges from the bodies. I got across the ditch and up the opposite steep ridge. I filled my shirt tails with all I could carry. Then I brought my tiny load to the sharpshooters. Sometimes I tripped over bodies or tree stumps. I remember hearing a chorus of gasps after one fall, perhaps from men fearing for my safety. On one trip back, Colonel Malberg ordered me to the rear wagons for more cartridges. Bring caliber 54, he yelled after me. The men's muskets were filling with dirt. He thought smaller cartridges would load easier. So this was a a slight difference that most people wouldn't pick up. I started back, but my path was cut off by rebel fire. I raced toward the clearing. Thick puffs of dust rose where musket balls hit the dry hills. Enemy fire whizzed and zinged past my head. Suddenly, a bullet struck my right thigh. Blood sloshed in my boot like a puddle of water. I kept climbing the hill but had to stop every few feet. I grew dizzy from loss of blood. My legs wobbled and my eyes blurred. I worried I couldn't make it to the rear regiment. I think I started to cry. Somehow I reached the hilltop and level ground. A few yards away, who should I spot but General Sherman watching the lines? I hobbled to him and cried something like, General Sherman, please send ammunition to Colonel Malberg. The men are all out. I can't collect any. General Sherman asked my regiment and where the enemy was, but he mainly seemed troubled by my bleeding. Never mind me, send send ammunition, I told him. Um, And he said he would do that. And then as he limped off to the hospital, he remembered the rest of Colonel's message. I turned around and called caliber 54. 
I hear General Sherman was most impressed that I recalled the cartridge size while so weak. He plans to write Secretary of War Stanton on my behalf. And that's kind of how that <laughs> oh happened. Oh, my God. That's like, oh, man, what a tough little boy. It's just mind-blowing that he's so young. I mean, I can't imagine many 14-year-olds today being stuck in that position and, and dealing like with that. Um, unbelievable. Now, how did the rest of that... So it's the Siege of Vicksburg, is that right? Uh, yes, it was one of the battles for the Siege of Vicksburg. And what wound up happening is they didn't exactly break through, but they wound up making a significant gain so that the next time there was a battle, they, they were able to take Vicksburg. Wow. That is just <laughs> unbelievable. And you said, um, it's funny because this, this episode is just as much drum as it is like military history, but you said, so he, he on purpose wanted to do a smaller caliber, um, you know, I guess it's not a bullet, but we'll call it a bullet for, for now. Um, but to to because it was there was dirt and everything filling in the the um, gun, so he wanted it to. It would be easier to load that way, right? Yes. Yes. Wow, that's fascinating. Okay, so, um, all right, so our, you know, hero drummer boy, so he gets taken away. Then, um, he's out of. Is he out of the rest of the um, civil war, or does he come back? Well, he w he was sent home so that he could heal. But he, he wanted to go back. And uh, once his leg healed, he returned. And so did his longing to finish the war. And on December 25th, 1863, Orion re-enlisted in the 55th Regiment. Mm -hmm. And this time, though, he was assigned as orderly for General Guile Smith. And Orion stayed with the 55th until November 3rd, 1864, five, uh, five months before the war ended. And by then, he had taken part in 14 battles. Jeez, that's unbelievable. I mean, it's like you said, December 25th, he went back in. It's like, you know, Merry Christmas. I'm <laughs> going back to, <laughs> to fight. God, his his mom must have been very proud. I mean, I guess she's you're, she must have been used to a family of, um, you know, soldiers. And then his brother was obviously still... Um, in the battle as well, right? Did he make it through okay? Yes. In fact, um, when General Sherman barreled east, they defeated rebels in the, you know, along the way. And Liston House stayed with Sherman's division until he reached the Atlantic. So that was the end of the war. And Liston became the youngest, longest serving Illinois drummer in the Civil War. Wow. There, there are discrepancies about both boys, especially in Illinois, where we're really proud of them um you know the accolades are that they you know that orion was the youngest uh, congressional medal of honor winner which wasn't true and that uh liston was the youngest um drummer in the in the war altogether but it, he really wasn't it was the youngest in illinois hmm. now all right so that being you know, said, do you know, and I'm sure we can, I can Google it, but like, who was the youngest drummer in the Civil War? Is that a known person? I believe that was Johnny Clem. Oh, that was Johnny Clem. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, gosh, these, these kids, it's just unbelievable. Now, it, it, it seems like if you're a, uh, a 10 year old, how old was Johnny Clem when he was in it? I know you said he, uh, he entered it at age nine at nine. Oh my God. All right, so if you're nine years old, do you really have any other option of what you can do in the war besides being a drummer boy? I mean, is there anything else for you to do besides drumming? Well, obviously, Orion was um, an orderly. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. You know, I'm sure they could help with mess, meaning um, food, food preparation. Um, I know as they were getting deeper into the South and food was getting not only worse, but uh, scarcer, um, the boys would run off and try and scrounge what they could from different farms around there. Um, mm -hmm. I guess we could call it stealing. Yeah, no, but <laughs> pretty, pretty serious uh, times where you got to do what you got to do. So, okay, cool. Now, um, this is just an interesting side note that I, I think, you know, you might find interesting. So um, there's a very famous and people listening to the show, probably they know all about this from hearing this, but 
uh, Sanford Moeller is a um, he's a very famous. I guess you'd call him a teacher. He created the Moeller technique, which uh, derived from the story goes that he was um, he would go and when he was younger, hang out with uh, Civil War veterans and would watch these guys play who would basically be, you know, Johnny Clem or Orion P. Howe, for example, type guys. And he would watch their technique um, of how they play and how they were getting extreme volume and they were still playing this certain kind of technique um, at 80 years old. And then he adopted that and created the molar technique, which is still very prevalent today and a lot of drummers use it. Um, but that directly um, goes back to him watching Civil War drummers. So I, I just thought you might find that kind of interesting how it developed from Civil War. Yeah. Okay, cool. Now, um, all right, Orion lived on to be 81 years old. And on that note, it's just so interesting to me that he was like wounded in his leg and the the level of like um, medical technology at that point, the fact that he could go back into the war. You know what I mean? Like you you think of like, all of the problems that could have arise from having this musket ball in your leg that's, you know, you think of all the amputations and stuff. So he's pretty lucky that he survived, let alone went back into the war. Uh, true, because the main, the main vehicle for surgery was to amputate. Yeah. <laughs> Which is awful. That's terrible. So obviously maybe his wasn't as bad, but it was bad enough that he got to go home and heal. Yeah. Okay. And then I have another, like, you know, again, not as drum drummy of a question, but more of a military question. And I've always wondered this, like, so it would have been probably, um, maybe I forget you said general Sherman, right. Who was, he was wor like going and reporting to give more, um, uh, of the ammunition to, right. Like he kind of witnessed right. his v valor, I guess you call it. Does Sherman then like, I've always wondered, how does someone report that this soldier should get a Medal of Honor? Would it be Sherman then goes to the higher ups and says, this boy needs a Medal of Honor? How does that work? Well, in the olden days, you wrote letters. So General Sherman wrote a letter to the Secretary of State Stanton about Orion. And then President Lincoln awarded him entry to the Naval, U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis um, because he was too young to go to uh, West Point. Um, but it, it took several years before um, he received the Congressional Medal of Honor. That was in 1896, when I guess some article must have come up or whatever, and people remembered, hey, yeah, this is really brave, and he deserves this Medal of Honor. Hmm. That's awesome, because, I mean, he would have been, uh, you know, obviously a little bit older. He lived to 1930, so after the Civil War, the next big war that, you know, would have happened would have been World War One, as far as wars that he could have been involved in, so he would have been too old, so... Um, well, it's also my understanding that um, Fife and Drum started to be lessened yeah, as exactly. communication tools, because by then, you know, you've got an active... Um, telegraph machines you've got um morse code you've got um i was the telephone they had a telephone by then although yeah, not right. much i mean it wasn't like having a cell phone but um there were other means of communication so the the boys weren't as necessary sure and um the episode you were referring to before which is a great one that people can check out is uh the history of u.s military drumming with patrick uh jones who's a great guy and, and very knowledgeable about all this um so um he talked all about that about how it just it kind of phased out of like you know it's just not as prevalent and necessary and i've got a lot of uh episodes there's actually a recent one which will be out uh before this which is uh the history of Noble and Cooley, which they made um, rope tension drums. They made toy drums, uh, and then they got commissioned by um, the U.S. government to start making um, uh, drums for the for the war effort. Um, so it just it just shook everyone's uh, <laughs> it just shook up everything for everyone. So wow. Okay. So then uh, so he went to um the naval academy right and then did he go back into the service as just like a uh you know 
a general? I, obviously, he didn't see battle again, but what did he do after the Naval Academy? No. Um, he he was a merchant marine for a while. He was kind of a vagabond, I get the impression. Mm. Um, and um, he came out a corporal, so he wasn't all that high level. You know, he moved up, but not all that much. And then he um, and then he uh, received schooling as a dentist. And it's a little murkier exactly when that happened. Uh, he moved to uh, Streeter for a while, then he would move elsewhere, and it says he died in St. Louis where his daughter was, but that was only after his second wife died in Streeter. So he had a, a, a bunch of, he, was, he, he opened up a saddle shop, so he was making saddles and things like that, okay. and then he went to be a dentist and, um, and did that until he retired. Wow. Okay, that came out of left field. Like, okay, I'm going to be a dentist now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's unclear, especially since he didn't have the most scholarly reputation in terms of when he was at the Naval Academy. Um, you know, it seemed like he was a good guy who, who was brave and had lots of courage. I mean, I don't I don't know how to explain him any other way. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, boy, what a uh, what a fascinating young young man. You don't hear about guys like him too often, but, um, these poor little kids. So let's talk a little bit about your book, um, which is, uh, it's, it is a kid's book. Like it's, you said, I believe it's for like sixth graders, typically fourth to sixth grade, um, yeah. diary of a drummer boy, which is kind of a fictionalized version of his life. Um, which I just think it's neat because this is the kind of thing where, you know, if you're a young kid and you're, drum crazy like many of us are and many of us were as kids you'd love reading this so i think if people out there have grandkids or kids this is just a pretty neat thing to pick up that's history you know war stuff which a lot of little boys and little girls really like um i know i did so um how did you go about how did you learn about orion p howe um, I was doing a book earlier called Extraordinary Young People, and I was looking for uh, young people who were doing anything that was beyond the norm for their age and were, you know, and their time. And I went to my library and I saw a flyer where the Lake County um, Historical Society or Lake County Museum was having um, a drummer boy exhibit. And I didn't know much about them. And so I called up the museum and I said, explain my situation. And they said, we have the perfect boy for you. And that's how I first learned about Orion. But that was only the beginning. Um, I love it when I can do research closer to home and I don't live that far from Waukegan. So I could go there and I could picture uh, his house overlooking the ravine. I could go to the historical society and do research firsthand. I could get diaries and letters that the boys um, wrote home um, and what uh, what their families wrote to them and get a clear idea of what was going on in Waukegan at the time and also what it was like to, to be in the war. Hmm. Jeez, that's awesome. So then you... Um and I haven't read the book. I'll be full full transparency. I tried to get a, a digital copy and it just didn't work out. But I think we've still gotten a good, very good representation. But how how did you like, so do you sort of like, when you fictionalize a story like that do, for kids, do you sort of just like add in kind of like how they make a screenplay out of like, um, you know, a, a story? Do you add in little bits of like, you know, um, drama and just more reality? Is that kind of what happens in, in this situation? Uh, well, it's different for everybody, but for me, historical fiction is always about a real person, usually a young person, and a real event that happened in their lives. And the reason it's called fictionalized or historical fiction is because, obviously, I wasn't there. So there's going to be elements of it that that have to be interpreted, uh, yeah. assumed if you will. Of and, course. um, but I try and like going back to the 55th regiment, I mean, I got real situations, really people talking to each other and I hope it's as close to fact as possible. Yeah, no, I'm sure it's very thorough. Now a question just popped into my head, which you probably don't know the answer to, but it makes me wonder, like if you're a drummer boy, like it almost seems like him playing the drums wasn't like he was a diehard born to be drummer. It's like 
because you said he did other jobs. Like, I wonder if when he got out of when the Civil War ended, if he continued to like practice his drum playing the snare or if, you know, in like the he died in the 30s. He, I doubt he did when he was I doubt he got a drum set, you know, in the 20s when they were really starting to get more popularized because he'd be a 70 year old man. But I wonder if he still enjoyed practicing and if he, you know, played you know, his, his rudimental stuff and practice when he was more of an adult. I got the impression that when he was young, he really, really liked it. And of course, probably wanted to please his father. Um, the other, in terms of what happened when he was older, there is nothing that I found that he continued drumming. So I don't Mm -hmm. know for sure. Um, I don't also know if he was allowed to keep the drum that he was given during the civil war not not all drummers were were able to keep theirs in fact when i was doing a little research recently i found that one drummer uh, it, it verified that he took his drum home with him but it, it it sounded like it was so odd that it usually didn't happen yeah they're not from what i've heard from doing these episodes about the more you know rope tension kind of civil war era drums is they're not that common like you a lot of people wonder too, like what ha- they are out there, but it's like, what happened to these drums? Like there's, there was a ton of them made, but maybe they were destroyed. Maybe they were lost to fires. Maybe they were left on a battlefield and just rotted away. Um, who knows? It's cause they're really, really works of art and historical. I mean, they're so significant. Um, I know the Lake County Museum has um, has a, a Civil War drum, but mm-hmm. interestingly, it looked like one that I had borrowed from uh, a neighbor family whose son had a drum set. It was a ki- obviously a kid's drum set, but it had the same kinds of decorations, which they used to have on all the drums back then. Mm-hmm. So there would That's be... You know, there the, there were paintings um, that displayed Union eagles and Confederate shields. Uh, sometimes there would be stars on them. So they were hand painted decorations that were made each one a little bit unique. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They're they're it's but like you always you typically see an eagle. You typically see like designs like that. Um, so the eagle and all of the Union stuff. It just makes me wonder too. Like, so we're talking, this has all pretty much been about the Union, the North. In the South, in your experience, do you know, did they have similar drummer boy experiences? Uh, Yes, they definitely did. Um, The only difference I found is that the Confederate States um, tended to have 11 stars on their drums instead of 13 to distinguish them. But they had the same same drummer boys who were drumming out uh, the same rhythms to make, you know, to make things happen. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's obvious because like we're not, I mean, they could literally be like next door neighbors, but depending on where the state line was, you're now enemies, which is so it's not like, it's not like a different country, obviously it's, it's so it's such a interesting uh, war, but well, that's great. Okay. Well, this is really fascinating stuff. Is there any other uh, kind of fun tidbits from his life that you think might be interesting to people? Um, you know, drum, drum or no drum? Well, um, can I add Liston, his younger brother? Oh, please. Yeah, yeah. Talk about his family in general. Just as, yeah, anything about them. Uh, well, Liston, after the war, he wound up, um, he moved, he moved to, he worked on railroads and eventually he was the uh, head railroad person in Ed Streeter, Illinois. And then he decided to make more money, so he went into the coal business. He was able to invent something that helped the coal industry, and that's what um, allowed him to kind of live his, the rest of his life in Streeter pretty much, you know, uh, a lot easier. And uh, both of the boys were honored in Streeter. Uh, there's... Um, there's a, exhibits at the Streeter Museum. There's an obelisk there. There's um, there's a school in Waukegan named after well that Orion Howe. So they've they've established all kinds of honorary things besides the Congressional Medal of Honor. Hmm, that's neat. What a, I mean, 
for a family like that to stand out and kind of be, I don't know, like there's so many soldiers and there's so many people and so many even drummer boys. It's just fascinating. And it's great that they, their, you know, valor to keep using that word really stands out to this day. And, um, they really did a lot. I mean, what a, what an impressive family. It's kind of a shame they don't, I mean, a lot of people know about them, hopefully, but right now we're getting the word out more, which I think is, is a great thing. Uh, there must be some interest. I know there was an article written in Waukegan about Orion and Liston just this last Veterans Day. So every once in a while, things bubble up. And about the same time that my book came out, there were two two novels for uh, slightly older kids that also came out. And then then there's been nothing. So it's 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 kind of weird. Yeah. Um, and there's also a really good book. I, d I don't know if it's is accessible now called The Boys War by Jim Murphy. And um, that taught, has a huge section about about drummer boys. Um, and that's all I got in that one. Cool. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Well, um, I feel this is just such an interesting topic and it's different, which I always love to do on the show is to do uh, kind of different stuff. So um why don't you, Marlene, tell people where they can uh, check you out? Um, again, you typically write kind of books for younger people, but I think a lot of people who listen to the show, myself included, have kids and have grandkids and can uh, get them some stuff. So where can they learn more about your books? Uh, you can learn more about my books from MarleneTargbrill.com. That's M-A-R-L-E-N-E-T as in Tom, A-R-G as in George Brill. Dot com. Um, in terms of getting Diary of a Drummer Boy, uh, you can either contact me and I would have hard copies and paperbacks, or you could go at just about any place online. It's available for for um, on demand, so you could get it that way. Great. Cool. Well, this is a fun one. Um, I appreciate you uh, kind of taking the risk to come and talk to, uh, you know, about drums as a non-drummer, and uh, I think... I think you did a great job and um, it was really neat to hear just the, the, the excerpts from the story and hear about his, his moment of, uh, of, of, I feel like it, it really kind of defines you those moments of like, like in the battle when he was going to get the, the cartridges or when he was going to get the, uh, the ammunition, what a brave little boy. I mean, and he is, he's a little boy. Like <laughs> he's probably more of a man than me, but but he's really a little boy and that's just so impressive. So I loved hearing the story. Well, thank you for having me. This has been, this has been wonderful. And something I could tell my daughters is also a drummer. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. So, so it's cool that your, your daughter, how old is your daughter? My daughter is 38. Oh, great. Nice. How long has she played the drums? She's played the drums. I know since junior high age, she had a that's band awesome. in high school and she just enjoys drumming. So she plays all different kinds of drums and, um, you know, she'll join different groups, but, you know, nothing formal now. Oh, yeah, sure. No, but that's uh, that's awesome. Um, so you get it. You are connected to drummers because um, your, your daughter is one. So you I'm sure you grew up with drums constantly being played in your house and uh, <laughs> hearing the noise. <laughs> well, it wasn't too bad. She she entered drumming about the time that we were redoing our basement, so we insulated it. <laughs> Good, smart, yeah, yeah. I'm moving uh, in ten. No, I'm moving in seven days, and uh, I'm going to be doing the third floor of my house up and um, and renovating it. And I'm going to try and insulate a bunch because you're right. That's uh, but God, the difference between having drums in a basement versus a third floor is big because it it shakes your whole house when it's when you're up top. So, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, Marlene, this is awesome. Thank you again for coming on the show and being such a, a nice person and sharing um, all of this information with us. And I want to thank Eric. I think I'm saying it right. McKnight, McKnight for, for just sending that comment to me and saying, um, this is a cool topic. So as everyone who listens to the show knows, um, if you ever have any ideas, send them my way and, uh, they typically take a long time to put together. Um, so if anyone has suggested something to me, just know that I, I have a list, um, of really cool episode ideas. There's history of cocktail kits, um, phosphorus, uh, let's see, there's a ton of them. Alan Dawson episode, um, history of moon gel. I'm working on one about, um, the modern 
calfskin heads being made, but these take a while. But with Marlene, it took about four days for us to get it set up. So that was very fast. So um, on that note, Marlene, thank you for being here and uh, good luck with the rest of, uh, you know, 2020 and hopefully we make it through okay (laughs) oh i know we will stay safe everybody and thank you so much for having me okay bye marlene thank you Bye. if you like this podcast find me on social media at drum history and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future until next time keep on learning this is a gwyn sound podcast